Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 400 of them by now. And if this is new to you, please um, go to batgap.com and you'll see all the previous ones archived and organized in various different ways and you can check out those. Um, this uh, program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. I say this every week. Um, so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. Uh, my guest today is Tony Samara, um, whom I f have found to be a very interesting person, having listened to about six hours of his interviews in the previous week. Um, I, was, I had a couple of two-hour drives and some grass to cut, so I got plenty of chance to listen. Um, Tony has, is rather prolific. He's written a number of books, um, Shaman's Wisdom, um, Discover Your Inner Buddha, Ancient Wisdom for Reality Creators, and a number of others, um, and has been inspiring thousands of readers to discover inner peace and greater fulfillment in their lives through the power and simplicity of practical spirituality. At the core of his teachings lies the evolution of human consciousness and the joyous illumination of each individual's inner quest. So that's a short bio, um, and we'll get into a much longer bio as we talk, um, because as I said, Tony has lived a very interesting life, and um, he's got a lot to say. And, you know, usually these interviews consist of, a, you know, sort of the biographical stuff about what the person has gone through, and that in itself usually contains a lot of knowledge, you know, it just comes out when you hear what a person's been through. And then there's also the stuff that's more explicitly the teaching, if there is a teaching, you know, what, what the person has to convey. I think um, Tony has plenty to say uh, on both of those themes. So, but I think we'll start with the biographical stuff. And as I recall, Tony, from listening to your other talks and interviews, um, your interest in spirituality, although you may not have called it that at the time, started at a fairly early age, right? That's right. Um, I didn't call it spirituality because, you know, when you're a little child, you don't know what spirituality means. Right. You're just living life in the moment. <laughs> yeah. So um, for me, um, looking back, I'm able to create an idea of what spirituality means for children. So basically, um, I, as a child, I had access to various dimensions of reality that most children don't really understand or um, comprehend so easily. Um, so, such as? Well, such as being able to see into people, not just from the, not just seeing a person through the words that they're communicating or body language that they're conveying, but seeing more deeply into a person. Mm. It's a sort of perception, which perhaps in New Age um, spirituality is called being sensitive or mm -hmm. indigo child. I don't know what mm. terms they use today. But I would say just being able to perceive things in a very different way. Like, for instance, can you give us an example? Well, I grew up in Egypt mm -hmm. and um, I, I was very creative in the way that I understood the world. Um, so perhaps this was a little bit of a mixture of creativity with insight. Mm -hmm. I was able to see, I was able to see um, a lot into um, the ancient people that lived in Egypt, you know, the pharaohs. And I used to speak to my brothers and people around me about their lifestyle, information that wasn't in history books, you hmm. know, just very specific ways of doing things. But from a child perspective, you know, it's just as if you're watching something that's happening um, right in front of you and you're describing it from a very basic, you know, observation. Uh. It wasn't very in depth. So I would explain things about clothes, and foods that they ate and rituals that they um, participated in. But, you know, this wasn't part of my education. So it was something that my parents thought was very interesting. They called it very creative, imaginative type yeah. um, child, you know. Um, but so I, you weren't getting that from books or anything. You were just coming out with this stuff. You were sitting uh, there yeah. describing pharaohs. Yeah, as children do, you know, when they sit and do something exciting, yeah. they be to sing a song or begin to describe things. And sometimes there is a lot of interesting wisdom or very interesting information that you can perceive mm -hmm. if you are present to what, what's behind, you know, what the child is doing, what's behind the words um, being conveyed. So, Were you also picking up stuff from living people like that ordinarily wouldn't be um, noticeable? 
I was very, very sensitive, you know, um, so I would explain things about physical, emotional, um, um, emotional problems that people had in a way that a child, I, I was five, six at the time, um, described things in a way that looking back now, I understand was a sensitivity that's not normal. So I, I think sensitivity is universal. But mm -hmm. somehow I, I was initiated into being more sensitive on some level than most of the young children around me um, for some reason. I don't know why, mm -hmm. um, but looking back, I, I see that sensitivity to have played a very major part in my spiritual pra um, development. I'm guessing that this sensitivity worked both ways. It not only made you more perceptive, but it made you more vulnerable. Exactly. And also more physically sick. Uh -huh. So as a child, I suffered from a lot of um, ill health. So I was sensitive to any disharmony, any sort of conflict anything, in the environment. Conflict, exactly. And I grew up, as as you know, in areas of conflict because my parents were diplomats. So yeah. that was their job, you know, to mm. work in places of conflict because um, they they were working on the peace process. Um, so you know, I was sensitive to very interesting aspects of the world, but also if as a child, you know, perhaps too vulnerable to situations that didn't make sense to me. Hmm. A lot of people I know feel like that we're that sometimes spiritual people are like washing machines where we're kind of picking up on stuff in the environment and processing it through our own nervous systems and resolving it that way in, in, in order to help the world or help specific individuals or situations. Do you get a sense exactly. of that? Yeah. I totally agree, and I think not just human beings, but also animals, especially mm. dogs and cats. Yeah. Um, they have, you know, harmony is innate in all living beings, you know, human beings, um, animals, and it's an innate quality that we um, somehow we lose perhaps through socialization, but it's still very much the core of our being, and we're always trying to harmonize things. And as a child, when you're less, um, less um, what, what's the word <laughs> less less um, influenced by socialization right. um, then, less conditioned then, less conditioned exactly right. um, then it's very easy to to be vulnerable to situations in that way where you're you're harmonizing um, for the good of humanity whatever is out of out of sync or not mm -hmm. working very well around you and there were many many difficult situations that I faced as a child I think all children today um, you know, uh, are faced with many choices that aren't very easy. But I perhaps, being in a third world country, I perhaps was exposed to like situations that were a little bit different than yeah. most children in the Western world. Mm. This thing you're saying about sensitivity and being like a washing machine is interesting. Um, I have a friend who is highly awakened, who is always sort of scratching her head and thinking, why is it that so many spiritual teachers seem to go through so much difficulty in terms of their health and, you know, various stuff they go through. And I, th mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, people in general do, but it almost seems to be a syndrome sometimes where mm -hmm. these people are like sponges, they're soaking up a lot of stuff and then kind of resolving it. That's my answer. But w would you concur? No. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah. I think that it's an initiation into compassion. Yeah. And when you actually experience life from very harsh or difficult perspectives, then um, you you become more compassionate and more open-minded and you become more aware of what that means in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't actually spoken to any um, very deeply spiritual person that hasn't experienced some sort of painful initiation. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, it's not a negative. You know, many people think going through pain is a negative, but that's a perception that we've been socialized to think, you know, life is perfect. So whatever you're going through uh, is a learning process. So mm -hmm. if you see it in a positive way, as I do now, um, I, I think it's um, very beneficial in being more compassionate and being more sensitive to people's actual experience, understanding their experience. So I think this experience allowed me that my sickness and my sensitivity allowed me to see um, the world in a different perspective growing up as a teenager and growing up as an adult, um, you know, helped me to see things in a different way. Yeah.
and there seem to be degrees of it. I mean, some people get off pretty easy, and others really go through hell for a long time, you know? Yeah, I mean, any any pain is difficult. <laughs> and when you're in it, 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 it seems like it's very, very difficult. But it does seem like some people attract a lot of pain yeah. consistently. Um, or I maybe they have more karma to work off or something, I don't know. Who knows, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, my childhood was terrible, right. but I had moments of deep um, disharmony, uh, like disharmony physically, emotionally. Um, there were situations that really disturbed me. For example, the pain and suffering of people around me, mm -hmm. um, you know, just being so poor and just not being able to fulfill basic needs, you know, that create that was a powerful impression that allowed me to always be um, more open to seeing things from different perspectives, not just looking from one perspective, because I grew up in a very wealthy environment, you know, right. so I was open to seeing that not everyone is the same, you know, mm -hmm. some people grow up like the Buddha, grow up in a little beautiful castle and they're sort of um, separated from the actual reality of what's happening around them, right. but I, I, I so I was able to see both worlds. Yeah, so um, I think it would be jumping ahead too much to explain why you're healthy now, but maybe we can discuss that in the course of the conversation. What do you think? Sounds good because it's important. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so if if that sensitivity and being in Egypt and all that were were the first significant milestone that comes to mind, what would the next be? The next would be uh, what my mother <laughs> Uh, once shared with me, she said, I don't know where you got this sort of idea from, but you explained about vegetarianism and there definitely, you know, that was not an aspect of anything that we ever spoke about. Yeah. Um, they are totally, they didn't know anything about vegetarianism and I grew up in a place where that wasn't normal, you know, not in California right. or the UK. I was in a place where just people just didn't understand vegetarianism and I um, described at the age of eight, I was told, um, um, how much suffering animals go through to just be present as part of our dinner. And you described that, was, that to your parents, yeah, okay? To my parents and everyone present, my brothers. Oh, wow. um, and after an hour of speaking, they just put the food away and they just had to change. <laughs> you know, they couldn't eat because, and they didn't know where the information came huh. from. Did you, know? you convert so, them to vegetarianism or just no, use no, yourself? No, not at all, just for the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm not trying to convert anyone to vegetarianism. It was just, you know, for her, it was just like incredible that, you know, I came up with um, these interesting um, informations that came out of nowhere. And I continued to do this, not just about food, but mm -hmm. about many aspects of life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they don't, they're, they're not religious and they um, don't believe in reincarnation. They didn't believe in reincarnation. Um, and so, you know, for them, it was just like, this is an incredible, interesting situation. It's happening. Yeah. We don't really understand where the information is coming from. Who is so this kid? Where did he come from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just going to mention reincarnation. Did you ever have any like clear past life memories that could account for your precociousness in the spiritual you know, world? I'm very hesitant to use the word reincarnation because mm -hmm. I think it's been um, used in a way that that doesn't really convey its true meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone is speaking about karma and reincarnation and what have you today, and I don't know if, it, if it's truly understood. So mm -hmm. I don't really see reincarnation in the same way um, as, say, Hinduism, you know, where, you know, you, whatever you do allows you to um, come back to a rebirth that right. is very specific to what you've done. I think it's it's much more complex than this, and I, I, I don't believe that religions, uh, whether it be Hinduism or Christianity or um, Buddhism, have um, a clear understanding of what happens after death. You know, mm. we all we can all talk about things, but in the end, you know, it's only our experience that allows us to understand the truth of what's happening. Yeah. Do you have the the sense though that? Um, we're on a, a, a evolutionary trajectory that is much longer than an individual lifetime. However, the mechanics of that may work. It's, it's, a, it's, sure. a, it's a long-term project. 
Exactly, exactly. It's not as simple as what's happening today or what happened yesterday. Right. Uh, and I see this um, very often in people, you know, you see that beyond personality traits, there are certain aspects that perhaps are genetically um, transmitted, you know, into the personal um, communication of that person um, saying whatever, but th there is a depth behind our, um, behind everything that we, we don't understand. Um, neuroscience is beginning to understand today a little bit more about the complexity of what it means to be human, but even we're just at the beginning. Uh, I believe we're just at the beginning of understanding something so complex that, you know, in words we can't really convey um, what happens. Reincarnation is a word, you know, yeah. what does it mean? What does it really explain? It doesn't explain very much to me. Yeah, it's a beautiful point. I often ponder that notion in through various examples. For instance, I mean, a, a single cell uh, is more complex than the city of Tokyo, and we have about a hundred trillion of them in our bodies, plus uh, even many more times that number of non-human cells, the microbiome. And so it's this exactly. amazing, you know, instrument that we occupy, and exactly. you know, we just kind of blithely go along through life, yada yada, you know. But it's <laughs> like this, there's this miracle taking place. Every moment, and you know, that's just the cells. Who knows what else exists yeah. beyond the physical? Exactly, you know? all the subtle so, levels and everything. Exactly. So yeah. we, we are too complex to simplify experience into like a word such as reincarnation or spiritual. Mm -hmm. I, I'm always hesitant to use these words because very often it creates dogmatism. It creates a belief system that okay, we understand our experience because yeah, we got it in a little experience box. means exactly, yeah. exactly means that you know this word that we're communicating we agree upon and that's what the experience is but actually it's it's so much more complex like you just said you know yeah so much more going on and yet and we'll get back to your personal story but and yet that there is something which we might call the simplest form of awareness you know there's a there's a verse from the Bhagavad Gita which says um, for endlessly branched for for endlessly branched and, I don't know, really somehow complicated are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one-pointed. So all this sort of fragmentation and complexity can be actually boiled down in one's experience to a, uh, you know, to a simple form of awareness, which is kind of at the core of things. Exactly, and that's the core of my teaching. Yeah, yeah good, good. Okay. It's not my teaching, it's everyone's teaching. Everyone's <laughs> teaching. <laughs> the perennial wisdom. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, would it be jumping ahead to begin to talk about your Zen phase? Are there some significant well, milestones in between there? Or? No, I mean, as a child, I was just unusual, and yeah. uh, I didn't like being unusual. You know, as you know, when you're a teenager, you want to be normal, you, fit you don't in, want yeah. to be different. Yeah. So that was a big thing for me um, and helped me to, to to embark upon the practical spiritual path, you know, learning meditation. Right. Um, so that, that started at the age of 14 mm -hmm. um, where I, I started learning a type of um, meditation that's very similar to TM. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually TM, but um, a little bit removed from the TM um, Hindu right. Yeah, exactly. It was psychologists who were working um, to promote this mantra type meditation, which oh. was based on TM teachings. Okay. Um, I was a TM and, teacher for 25 years, by the way, just for the record. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And that was a great experience. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think that TM is also an amazing, you know, um, teaching. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like the first real um, initiation into mm -hmm learning practical meditation to sit and meditate yeah um, so before zen um, and i did this for many years quite regularly um, yeah yeah every yeah. weekend um and also every day for an hour and um, despite studying at high school you know it was something i found fantastic That's it was great. just like a revelation to be able to sit in meditation uh -huh. now when i learned to meditate um my my friends were all into drugs at the time, and I just basically realized I've got to just be alone now. Yeah, I can't be with these people because I have to sort of chart my own course, and you know, so I just hang out with the dog. And uh, but after a few months, I collected new friends. I mean, did you find yourself to be a bit of a loner since you were meditating, exactly. or did you find kindred souls that you could? I, exactly like you say, you yeah. know, um, 
most of my friends were, you know, at the age where drinking yeah. too much and partying and doing all sorts of interesting things. But, you know, for me, um, my interest was more in meditation. So, yeah. you know, you, you tend to isolate yourself from the social setting around you mm -hmm. and, and and find a new sort of um, relationship to other people. And so, yeah, I, I began to uh, connect to people who are interested in meditation and consciousness. Good. So this for me was like an amazing experience because I never had that connection in my life. You know, I had my family and I had my friends, but none of them understood what, yeah. I, what I was going through. So I felt a bit weird, really. <laughs> <laughs> but now yeah. I felt, okay, this is normal. You know, there are people around me who enjoy meditation, who are talking about consciousness. And so for me, it was the greatest um, fun ever, you know, and I was enjoying myself. It wasn't like I'm meditating because I'm suffering. I was meditating because it was a joyous experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's a good point to make, and I would concur that it's it's an in, inherently blissful, enjoyable experience. It's not some arduous discipline. If it's done right, you, you it's, exactly. it's delightful. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is why every weekend, every free weekend, I would spend um, in retreats, mm -hmm. learning more meditation. And the more I meditated, the more impressed I was with where, you, what you could um, connect to. Um, you know, it's like opening a book and you get more interested once you, if it's a good book. Uh, yeah. Reading, you know, becomes more interesting and you can't put the book down. And yeah. it was the same for me. Um, but I realized that TM, you know, was interesting. But I wanted to work with um, a person from reading uh, and talking to people around me, a person who understood meditation from an awakened mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. And, and so I began searching for, for teachings that were conveying what it means to be awakened, but in a way that's not dogmatic or too religious. Because mm -hmm. for me, um, as soon as religion becomes too dogmatic, I, it's like the red lights just start blinking and I, I don't like it. Yeah. You know, I wasn't brought up in a religious way, so for me it's difficult. <laughs> There's a story, God and the devil are walking down the road and God sees something and picks it up and puts it in his pocket. And the devil said, hey, what'd you find? And, and the God said, oh, it's the truth. And the devil said, oh, give it to me. I'll organize it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly right. You know, for me, um, Zen Buddhism seemed from what I look, I looked at many aspects like Tibetan Buddhism and I looked at um, Hinduism and Zen Buddhism just seemed the simplest way, you know, to meditate. And I wanted something that was focused just on meditation. So um, especially um, Zazen, you know, which is the meditation practiced mm -hmm. in Zen, um, just seemed like the right thing. So that's, I started learning Zen meditation um, as a teenager. Yeah. And from there got so impressed with what, what, the whole practice that I decided to um, dedicate a few years um, of my life and sit in meditation in a monastery with a Zen master. Right, out in California, right? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the first and only time I spent a few years in California. <laughs> Beautiful place. Yeah. yeah, I found that phase of your story interesting because you were doing like 10 hours of meditation a day and plus ah. work, working in the garden and other things like that. And yeah. um, and you couldn't get enough of it, so you actually, and you're only sleeping a few hours a night, I think, as I recall. But you, you liked it so much that you would actually do extra meditation, sitting outside the Zen master's door or something at night. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the I reason I found that interesting hours. is that you know, um, I mean, I've talked to other people who did Zen meditation, like Adyashanti and Shinzen Young and others, and it was a real grind for them. It was like you know, like a struggle. It was difficult. They were in pain. They had to sit there even though they're in pain. And and it sounds to me like you really enjoyed it. Well, I mean, it is painful to sit. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, uh -huh. but most of the pain is emotional or mm. mental. You know, it's like anything. If your mind is blissful then pain can be transformed just because you are in a blissful state to something that's not so um, so present mm -hmm. in, in the physical body. So for me, the joy of sitting in meditation and the gratitude to be in a place where 
that was possible. And not only me sitting in meditation, but also so many people practicing meditation in the same way. So creating this energy bubble, yeah. this place of meditation where you just felt so in touch with spiritual dynamics of the world. I, I don't. I can't understand how anyone could not feel blissful in such a situation. You know. <laughs> well, you must have talked to some of your fellow monks there, and uh, you know, like for instance, with Adya and Shinzen, they they both said that it wasn't just the physical pain; it was just sort of the mind is wandering, and they, they you know, the, there was a sort of an inner struggle going on. But for you, it seems like you just naturally sunk into a, a blissful state. And I, I find part of the reason I find that interesting is that. As I, well, the, the mechanics of TM, which you've been practicing, are effortless and you don't concentrate and so on. But then Zen involves concentration, as I understand exactly. it. And, exactly. and you managed to make that shift and yet still found it blissful. Yes, I used actually the TM mm -hmm. uh, technique with Zen. How so? So, uh, so do you know, it wasn't that I was just sitting and focused on the breath counting. Mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That was only at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, to get the mind to be so focused and so clear that you could go a little bit beyond just the mental repetitive state of counting um, numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I think numbers are very important, but, you know, I think creativity is much more, um, it's a very powerful aspect of meditation that's often forgotten when you get too caught up in techniques. So. You know, I spoke to the Zen master about this and he said, of course, creativity is what meditation is about, you know, but first you have to discipline the mind, you know, so that you don't daydream and you don't just sort of um, use your creativity to fulfill your desires and your sort of mundane um, imagination. And stuff, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So for me, that I don't know, maybe it's just because of the sensitivity that I um, w w was initiated into as a child, you know, it just was easy. It wasn't yeah. difficult. That's good. And I think it should be easy for everyone. As soon as meditation gets difficult, I, 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 I believe then that something has to change, you know, the, the way that you're approaching things has to change because part of my teachings or everyone's teachings is that positivity, being positive, and not in that sort of pretense way, right. but being positive internally, being positive about your practice mm -hmm. is one of the most important um, wisdom tools that you can apply um, in transformation. Mm. Maybe we can dip into the consideration of the mechanics of meditation here for a moment. I mean, like, why would you say, I, I, I could answer some of these questions, but I want you to, why would you say the mind wanders? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, the mind is like you, yeah. when you're meditating, right? You, the yeah. whole point is to bring the mind into a fo kind of a focused, deep state. You don't want it to just be chit chitter chattering all over the place and wandering. So the question is, why is it wandering to begin with? Well, the chit chit chat mm -hmm. is actually an important aspect for you to for anyone mm -hmm. to realize. So I don't think that's a negative, you know, so the mind wandering off and just focusing on this on, uh, and focusing on that is actually a very useful mm -hmm. way to understand why the mind is working in that way in the first place. And for me, you know, if you want an intellectual description, um, you know, it's it all has to do with the ego, this idea that we're separate mm -hmm. from this moment. So this moment, you know, is recreated in the mind as something different from what it is. Um, so there is this internal dialogue that's constantly trying to reaffirm itself. Okay, this moment means this, and then the chit chat happens because the ego is really separate from this moment. But you know, that's just intellectual. Uh, for me, that doesn't make sense when you're actually sitting in meditation and the mind is chit chatting. Right. How do you actually, how do you deal with it is more important. You know, and for me, the way to deal or interact with that inner communication is to come back to a level of heart connection that allows you to bypass the ego. So to come back to real deep feeling and what that deep feeling means in the moment is, is very different than just saying, okay, I have to discipline my mind and I have to stop it from wandering around. I, I did that a few times because, you know, my mind is very, very um, 
clever. So it, <laughs> it manages to think about all sorts of things sure. for whatever uh, reason. As does <laughs> everyone's pretty much. And, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I, I push myself to, you know, um, think about one thing, but you, you can't do that with the mind. You have to come back to a heartfelt space of connection. Yeah. And for me, that is what is important. You mm -hmm. know? So if there is chit chat, it's just because we're separate from the world. We're separate from what's going on. Yeah, and when you come back to that heartfelt space of connection, you know, what is your experience or what is one's experience? In, in, you know, just directly, I'm not intellectually, but you know, what, what is the quality of that experience? Well, well, I mean, I can speak from my perspective, mm -hmm. but I think that shouldn't be taken as what happens for everyone, right. because everyone is different, so everyone is unique. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's deep stillness yeah. and joy, um, and also being able to laugh at things in, in, in a way where, you know, you don't take your mind and you don't take what it thinks about so seriously. You don't, you don't look at it from that serious perspective that previously, um, you know, before I sat in meditation, I would look at death and I would look at suffering from a very sort of grim perspective, I would mm. say, you know, from this, gosh, the world is a terrible place. Mm. How could we be in this sort of mess? Why is the, the mess here in the first place? You know, it, it's a very negative perspective. And mm. I understand the negativity in, in that perspective, because of course, if you're separate from seeing things in a different way, then of course, you, you see it from the only way possible, which is the mental one. But if you connect to um, this moment that speaks a different language than just the mind, then you're connecting to many, many aspects that um, are difficult to portray in, uh, in, in language. You know, you're, you're connecting to yourself from a deeper perspective. And, and this is why there is stillness. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, it, it, in my understanding, the mind wanders because it's looking for happiness. You know, and if it's not really finding it, if it's just finding a little shred here and a little shred there, then it's it's wandering is kind of constant and frenetic and you know desperate almost. And uh, but it's like a dog. Let's say a dog is really hungry and it's sniffing all around the yard looking for scraps of food or whatever. And uh, but if you put a bowl of food at the door, then the dog will just come in and focus there and be kind of settled with that bowl of food. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. like what you're saying about settling into the heart, that would be the bowl of food. Um, exactly. You know, and it's so intrinsically gratifying that the, the frenetic wandering of the mind ceases and, and the sort of multi-divergent, scattered quality of the mind converges into one-pointedness. <clears throat> um, so exactly. that's kind of what I was getting at. But actually, do you know, the thing is, Western people have satisfied their basic needs. Yeah, but, but they're still unsatisfied. They are still unsatisfied, but there are many people that um, say, you know, in third world countries, not mm -hmm. everyone, um, who, who are unhappy because the physical needs haven't been met. Yeah. But it's the same circle. You know, people are trying to satisfy those needs, thinking that those needs will bring them back to a space of stillness. But actually, it's the mind that's creating all the confusion. So you can, and, and I don't say this to sort of, um, um, push aside that suffering, you know, when you don't have enough food um, is, you know, not important. But I understand how important, you know, suffering is and how important it is to satisfy one's hunger. Um, but we can change the confusion around that picture by also remembering that the mind is what is creating the confusion. It's not only the hunger. So, you know, this gets into a place that's perhaps not very politically correct. <laughs> you know, that even, you know, in India, because I, I, I worked in India for many months, you know, when people, um, poor people, um, don't have enough, you can still come back to a place of happiness, even when those basic needs haven't been fulfilled. So it's not just happiness. It, there are many... Um, what I call egoic confusions that we sort of chase in our mind as the, the, the ball of food that you're speaking about that the dog is looking for. And for some people it gets even more complex than happiness. Then we start identifying, identifying happiness as very specific. So we look at happiness meaning that we think happiness is something 
and that happiness then becomes very uh, limited to that something. So it could be money, like in the Western world. Um, you know, for some people, we don't even know that we're chasing, you know, money because we're looking for the happiness that's behind uh, the material world. Um, we, we just money becomes what we are chasing, or sexual satisfaction, or mental satisfaction, or physical satisfaction. You know, it, it's it's. Yeah. It's yeah, but it kind of all boils down to happiness. You know, I mean, that's we we may not yeah. realize that that's what we're looking for, but that's what we're looking for. Of course, if yeah. you're not happy, you're going to be yeah. you know, confused about why you're not connected to your heart. Yeah, and of course, all the scriptures say the kingdom of heaven is within, sat chit ananda, you know, all, you know, there's this reservoir of inner happiness. Um, <laughs> and But the there's something I just heard the other day from the Upanishads or something about how the Creator created the senses to be out, outward directed by nature. And um, exactly. and so we naturally start out like looking outside for that happiness that we inherently desire. Uh, but then you know someone like yourself who learns to meditate, they they take a 180 degree turn and ah, there's where the happiness is. You know that's the source of it. <laughs> exactly. But that's actually a very simple step. Mm -hmm. It's just the rewiring of the brain yeah. um, to connect to the internal um, sort of communication that most of us because of social belief systems, we sort of ignore. I mean, like in the UK, you just don't speak about yourself. You know, you speak about everything else, the weather and mm -hmm. politics and whatever else. You know, but you don't speak about yourself because it's just, you know, looking internally is just seen as something that you just don't do. You know, it's just not normal. So you have to rewire the brain to 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 go beyond that social belief system, um, where you're not just sitting. In meditation and people then think okay you're sitting and wasting time because you haven't got anything better to do <laughs> um, it's an actual positive activity that changes as we know from google and from other big organization meditation actually helps people to be um, more real and more productive and more everything you know it's not just more awakened you know you're you're more harmonious yeah when I first learned to meditate, I, I, I used to go out to a tree house in the backyard at this house where I was staying because it was noisy in the house and the people wrote this song, you know, hey Jude, up in your tree, um, get out of you and into me. You know, like I, they thought I was just being self-indulgent or something. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that's basically what people think about meditation. Yeah. Um, if, if it's not understood, but now we're beginning to understand it through science and um, you know, all the MRI imaging and all that sort of new technology, you know, we understand that things are changing inside, you know, internally, mm -hmm. we're rewiring the brain. So yeah. it's, it's not a waste of time. It's, it's actually something that um, I believe will help humanity to transform consciousness from looking out all the time mm -hmm. to realizing that we have precious gifts within ourselves that need to be uh, explored and communicated and investigated, you know, in, in yeah. a different way than history has um, allowed us to do. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, um, you know, rewiring the brain and all. I've heard you say that, you know, it might take 120 days to really reprogram the brain to get rid of a particular habit or something. And of course, the term neuroplasticity is very much in vogue these days. Um, yes. But I would say that it's not like, for most, you know, the, the, the rewiring starts from day one and is cumulative, you know, it's incre exactly. incremental and cumulative. So. Exactly. And you know, you can be going on for 50 years and still the rewiring takes place and there's always more that can be refined and, you know. Exactly. And yeah. that's why it's important to meditate every day. Right. And not just to meditate once and then you think, okay, I've done it and wait for another week or two weeks. Consistency um, is what helps the brain to actually, as you say, create um, a space where there is an accumulative effect of what you know of the practice that makes sense to to the brain, and sometimes it takes 50 years. Sometimes it takes longer mm -hmm. um, to to change things, but at least you're changing, and yeah. that is in itself the joy of life. You know that you you mm -hmm. you have the possibility to learn from the changes that are happening. You know, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, you know, has been meditating for decades. You know who he is, right? And, yeah. and uh, he's, he, he kind of quit the Seinfeld show because he was really tired, but he said that he, he later realized that if he were to meditate, 
he, he didn't used to meditate in the morning because he figured, well, I've just slept, why bother? He would just meditate in the afternoon to sort of recuperate. And he later realized that if I do it twice a day, I would have had much more energy during the whole day. I probably wouldn't have quit the Seinfeld show. And, and then recently he was talking to Tom Hanks and Tom was going to take a sabbatical for a year because he was burned out and Jerry said, well, learn to meditate and you won't need to do that. And sure enough, that's what happened. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, truly, that's one of the core aspects of universal teachings. Meditate in the morning, meditate in the evening. Mm -hmm. even, if, even if you have no time, just two minutes yeah. is better than nothing, you know, and um, I, I think this should be something that children are taught at school, you know, so that it's normal. And it is in some schools, yeah. Wow, that's there, amazing. There, yeah, there are schools in inner cities and all where programs of, of various different kinds of, kinds of meditation are being offered, and in prisons and places like that. It's really helping people. Perfect, yes. Yeah. Yes, that, um, I, I believe this to be like one of the major um, transformational tools and this is why I'm so happy when the Dalai Lama goes around you know inspires everyone with his smile and his sort of compassion to, to, to think that meditation is you know something that's not exotic or dogmatic you don't have to be religious you don't have to have certain strange belief systems that are different from your own um, it's just a practice you know it's like yeah. anything else <laughs> and a lot of that stigma has been eliminated since the 60s and 70s you know it's it used to be seem really weird and exotic now it's kind of mainstream i mean yoga is taught on every street corner practically you know every ymca and, and uh the meditation is kind of coming along with that so it's it's getting more yeah. into the culture i think i think in america you're more advanced in some <laughs> eastern european countries and some you know um, places it's still you know people see meditation as a cult or like uh, as a Eastern mm -hmm. um, religious practice rather than as a neutral um, practice that has nothing to do with religion, it has to do with emotional well being. So there's still some education in this part of the world anyway yeah. um, that needs to happen. But I know in America, especially California and the West, <laughs> you know, you're, you're pretty advanced. <laughs> and there's that, well, there's that popular phrase, you know, spiritual but not religious. A lot of people categorize exactly. themselves that way, and so maybe, exactly. maybe when you're in Eastern countries, you can popularize that notion. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's get back to you. Um, so you were in the Zen th monastery, meditating your brains out, and um, <laughs> and thoroughly enjoying it. Um, you, you even took a vow of celibacy at a certain point there. Um, and, uh, you have to be celibate in the monastery. Oh, in a monastery, right? of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, but I don't know, when you took that vow, were you thinking, okay, this is for life? Or were you thinking, okay, well, as long as I'm in this monastery? Well, I didn't know. I, I really went with an open mind. I, I yeah. thought I could be here for like a week or mm -hmm. the rest of my life. I don't know. I'll just see how things go. Yeah. yeah. And as it was, you were there, what, a year and a half or something? Yeah, almost two years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... So what uh, what finally prompted you to leave? Well, that's complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm very I'm a, I'm very individual, so I felt that you know, as an individual, it's important to share what I know with the world outside of a group setting, mm -hmm. and, and I still believe this to be important that every human being is unique. We're all born with gifts and, we, you know, we don't need to sort of, I know it's very useful for some people and I know part of many, it's part of many cultures to go to an ashram or to go to a temple or to go to a monastery. I, I think it has its place, but in the modern world, I, I truly believe that we have to be part of the world on some level, interact with the world on some level. So I, I felt that was important. So yeah. that was my driving force to go back to the world and see if what I had actually experienced in, in this beautiful place, I could have stayed there, it would have been easy and very blissful for mm -hmm. me. Um, if if this was possible to, to, to transfer this bliss and happiness in a world where everyone is faced with stress and anxiety and pollution and noise and people who aren't so nice and so open, you know, uh, you have people, you know, who just uh, who, who don't who are negative in their perspective of just their communication and what they do to you and I wanted to see could I survive you know with this in, in the world and it was very it was much more difficult than I 
than I thought, actually. Um, it, it was almost like, you know, going out naked into the world, you know, it was like quite an experience, you know, yeah. everyone, I felt everyone was just screaming at me, do you know, the mm -hmm. noise, because the, the monastery is so still and um, you sit in stillness, yeah. the noise and the amount of aggression and the amount of just disharmony that was obvious in the world was just a lot to to cope with the first few weeks. But I managed. You know, <laughs> we, we're we're adaptable. We human beings are really adaptable. Yeah. So I managed to get over that sensitivity and um, toughen up. Yeah, toughen up. <laughs> <laughs> a few a few pizzas and what have you. Yeah. Um, so um, okay, so that was California and. Would, would we be skipping ahead to get to India now, or, or was there something significant in between? No, that, that was basically from California, um, then going back to the UK mm -hmm. and just um, just living life there, you know, just working a little bit and doing things and adapting to the situation and then going to India yeah. um, just because it's a fascinating place. Oh, yeah. and for me, I, I was very fascinated with the history and especially um, the Jain tradition, you know, the very mm -hmm. um, peaceful tradition and the Hindu tradition and also the Christian tradition that is there, um, which um, is a type of um, Christianity that um, was, is very important in India. It, yeah. it, it, Did you meet Father Bede Griffiths by any chance? No, I didn't actually, yeah. but um, I met many very interesting people and yeah. many, many sadhus and many, many, I would say, awakened people. So it was, it was a, an amazing experience for me, um, which helped me to really clarify the teaching that I began to, um, after leaving India, began to sort of group of friends, few people mm -hmm. around me. Did you uh, spend time with Osho? I noticed there's some book about you and Osho or something. No, no, but I met many people who ha have spent time or um, were um, alive uh, when Osho was alive, were, you mm -hmm. know, part of the movement. Um, so, you know, it was in India, you meet all sorts of people. I wasn't traveling as a tourist. I was moving from one place to another, visiting and sacred places. So, you know, I, I would meet interesting people who, who were on that sort of journey, pilgrimage. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, you're doing some sort of spiritual practice as you travel around and, you know, maybe, were you sampling other spiritual practices and trying this and trying that that you would get from no, various teachers? Or? No, I was just interested in being present to the energy that was around me. So I wasn't actually um, learning anything more than what I'd learnt in my previous practice in, in the Zen monastery mm -hmm. or through the TM type meditation. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when when you learn something, I think in the end, there is no need to, this is my personal perspective, there is no need to sort of um, look into everything. Right. You know, once, you, once you're established in a practice, um, the practice teaches you. But what is important is to be around people or an atmosphere that is awakened. Yeah. So this is what I was actually looking for in India, to sit in a temple that was just beautiful and to be able to practice there without you know, having to, okay, I want to learn a little bit more about Hinduism or Jainism or Buddhism or what have you, Osho, uh, the Osho practice. Nothing wrong with learning all these things, but for me, I was too busy in my own practice to, to, to spend time learning more things, you know. Already, that was a full-time work. Um, so, you know, it was just meeting with people, sitting near sadhus, and just them saying nothing, and me just sitting there. And perhaps there is a transmission of some sorts that happens when you are in that space. Um, you know, that's non-verbal. It goes beyond learning a technique or learning like a specific tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is maybe why the teaching today is um, very, very um, eclectic. You know, it's 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 it it brings in many traditions. By the know, teaching, it, you mean your teaching? Yeah, yeah. Right. It's it's not you know this this is what you have to do. I adapt the situation according to you know the people I'm working with. If they're medical practitioners or if they're Hindus or if they're Christians, you know, 
I try to speak the same language so that I'm not speaking a foreign language, you know, so that there is a connection somewhere. Um, so it's eclectic. That's you know, good. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think if that's approached in the right spirit, that's that's very wise. Um, you know, it just it it sort of a, bespeaks of a, a universality in your perspective that. You know, all all streams lead to the ocean, and uh, you know whichever stream you happen to be flowing in, that'll take you to the ocean. And but here here's some support. Here's a here's some context in which you can flow with you know less obstruction or something. Exactly. But I do truly um, emphasize that everything is universal, mm -hmm. and people who think that you know one practice is better or different from another, mm -hmm. I think they are. It's an ego, a spiritual e egotism. <laughs> of some yeah. sorts, you know, where people say, I'm a Buddhist and that's the best you can be, or I'm a Hindu or I'm a Christian and this is, you know, the way. The only way. Uh, yeah. uh, the only way. I, I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're beyond that. Yeah. You know, that's perhaps the history of humanity in the past, but today there is a univer universal sort of truth that needs to be explored um, from different angles. And, you know, we can share that. Um, interesting understanding in different ways, you know, sure. through poetry, through creativity, through music, and it just enhances our understanding of that ocean. You know, it doesn't it doesn't create a difference. It just allows us to see that people see things differently. You know, some people look at the trees, other people look at the plants, you know, or yeah. the, the roses or what have you. <laughs> when when people try to tell me that such and such is the only way, I, I like to start talking astronomy with them. I say, well, physicists now, uh, cosmologists think there may be infinite number of universes. There are now thought to be two trillion galaxies in our universe. There's probably a hundred billion stars in each galaxy. Most of the Kepler telescope now indicates that there are planets around most stars, many of them apparently habitable. And, you know, undoubtedly there are, you know, on those habitable planets, there have been many religions. All right, so, and probably most of those religions are saying ours is the only way. <laughs> so how crazy is that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And there is, there is a multidimensionality even to those galaxies and stars. So we don't even know if what is going on, I mean, this gets a bit esoteric. No, I love but this. We don't, yeah, we don't even know if what is going on on this linear dimension mm -hmm. Is the expression of reality. We just we're comfortable with this linear dimension. So you know, speaking about religious truths from this dimension, we'll always find conflict. Um, but what about if we you know go for a little bit of a deeper perspective? Say when we dream, mm -hmm. are we dreaming the same dream? You know, in the right. end, uh, that's a different level of reality. So perhaps we're all dreaming from the very same perspective, but we can't communicate that because it's so beyond language that we only remember aspects of the dream when we come up um, out of um, sleep and we come up to the mental conceptualization level of thinking. And then we can say, ah, oh, I dreamed yesterday that I was floating in water. But, you know, then all of a sudden you're out of that level of communication that's important. Mm. And that's just one level. Beyond that, there are many. So yeah. this, is, this is why my teaching is not so much I don't use words. I'm so careful. This is perhaps why I don't use so many words with you. I try to make it as simple as possible because in the end, it's all about transmission mm -hmm. um, for me rather than, you know, inter intellectually trying to make sense of what it means to meditate. It's all about practice, but we have to start somewhere, especially when, you know, you have an active mind that is asking all these questions. Why am I sitting here when I could be, you know, going to the beach or why am I sitting here when this is so boring, you know, like people say meditation can be so boring. Well, then we have to explore, you know, the, the, the multidimensionality of experience beyond just, you know, sit here because you'll feel better or sit here because you will find happiness. There is, there is another space that we just don't even, we haven't begun to understand and this is, yeah. Yeah, this is why it's so important. Yeah. I guess one way of, of describing it is there's, if you want to just to use metaphors, there's this, like take the ocean, there's the horizontal view that you might get looking at the ocean, but then there's a vertical dimension that you don't see necessarily if you're just looking at the surface. And if you think you understand the, the Pacific Ocean, let's say, just by looking at the surface, you know, you've just begun. I mean, there's all this depth and all these life forms that live at various levels and so on. 
and um, you have to sort of take a 3D perspective to really understand the ocean. And same with the, you know, creation. Same with our experience. Spirituality is a, is like diving in that respect. I think. Like surfing, you like, know, for those who surf, you know, yeah. every wave is different, and you can only experience it as a, you know, as a tot total experience in that moment, and it makes total sense when you're there, and then. It's never that, OK, I've experienced this wave, so I understand the ocean. <laughs> mm, right. It's like it's different every time. You know? <laughs> yeah. So um, in your interview with Unconscious TV, one of them, um, I heard you mention that at one point there was a kind of a big aha realization moment for you. Um, mm -hmm. What was that? <laughs> And again, we're, we're, yeah, <laughs> what you just said, yeah, I mean, words are yeah. so <laughs> inadequate. And I have seen people with, producing YouTube videos in which they just stare at the camera, and I, and I think, I can't <laughs> interview this person. <laughs> I've got to talk. We have yeah, to have a discussion. You've got to have a dialogue of <laughs> right. that sort. Well, I think everyone has these aha moments, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I, I would say, if you want to explain things in words, you know, there are little aha moments. You know, when you just recognize something yeah. and there is an aha moment that is a million times or a trillion times more and it's the same. But your mind just restructures in such an, a, a radical way that it's not the same. Yeah. In the end, when you come back to your mind, it's not the same. Right. <laughs> you don't fall back into the old social habits or the old belief systems. It's, it's like something transforms. The, mm -hmm. the neurons just um, melt and you rewire them <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. But no, you are. <laughs> but I'm going to press you a little bit more on it. So, okay. you know, given uh, accepting we, that we understand the limitations of words and how, you know, you, words can't really do justice to this experience any more than describing what a strawberry tastes like is going to be the same as actually tasting one. Um, exactly. What what more can you s describe about what happened to you? Well, I can't describe exactly mm -hmm. um, in words what happened, but I can describe some of the um, transformations that happened later. Okay. So, in meditation, I, you know, I would c come out of meditation feeling more relaxed more connected, more still, more energized, more alive. That was my experience. Mm -hmm. But very often I would fall back into a system which would require more meditation. Right. Now I'm not saying I resolved all problems in the world, but mm -hmm. somehow problems didn't seem so important. Um, from that moment I expanded into a different dimensions. So I was almost looking at the world from outside in mm. rather than from in outside. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense to no, you. No, it kind of does. But, uh, so, you you know, shifted it, into it, some universal awareness which was yes, yes, kind of exactly. like, it's like some people think, okay, I am inside this body looking out and then at a certain point a shift can happen in which you realize, oh, this body is really inside me. Yeah, and even to the extent where you're looking and you realize that the body is not even really part of your experience. The body is just as temporary as you would see. Now, of course, it's not exactly the same, but this is just to make sense. Exactly if, as if you would see something moving. You see it there and there it's permanent and then it moves out of your, your vision and you don't see it and it's gone. So that same relationship to the body and that same relationship to uh, the, the old personality, I would like to call it like the, mm -hmm. um, the personality I was born with. So, you know, looking out in, nothing really changed because, you know, people still recognize me. I was still Tony. It wasn't like I changed my name and, you know, all of a sudden started speaking a different language. And certain characteristics um, people identified as still present, you know, sure. the way my movements, the way I, you know, look at people, the structure was still there, but something. Yeah. You didn't start <laughs> speaking Swahili all of a sudden or something. You're still, yeah, well, you still, you have your individual well, structure, which is. 
Yeah, and yeah. actually the individual structure became, I felt more comfortable right. in the individual structure because I wasn't identifying with it. I was looking from outside in. Mm. Um, so, you know, it was like I would slip into that and at times slip out because of the experience, which, mm -hmm. as you say, it's universal experience, allows you to connect to another aspect of what I believe to be everyone's personality, mm -hmm. this universality of consciousness that we are constantly dipping into. This is why we have the aha moments, but we don't remember because it's so quick that, you know, um, it, it's not dramatic enough to shift your awareness into this recognition. But when there is a very powerful, dramatic event, then this um, shift is remembered for, for much longer. I don't know if it's remembered forever. Um, for me, forever. Uh, but, so far. You know, for so, so far. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm still> young. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, for some people, I've read that there are, uh, there is a gradual awakening. This was the debate in um, Zen Buddhism. The, there was the Rinzai school of Zen Buddhism, which is, you know, one awakening and you are, you're there, mm -hmm. um, free of the ego. And then there is the, uh, and I'm simplifying, there is the other school that speaks about gradual awakening, that you, you just move deeper and deeper into this space of awakening and it makes more sense, you feel more comfortable. So I believe they're both right. But I do too. Me, yeah, for me, um, I believe that some people have an, a, an experience of awakening that just, it's impossible to fall back into the old ways of doing things. And there are other people that have those moments of awakening that aren't moments, they may be two or three minutes. And then, you know, it's remembered for a long time, but there needs to be more work to awaken, you know, um, to awaken the mind to radical shifts, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so well, we were talking about the the brain and the nervous system a little earlier, and uh, yeah. you know, and neuroplasticity, and and there's a physiological correlate to to enlightenment or to higher states of consciousness or whatever, and and the physiology doesn't utterly transform itself in an instant. Um, it takes time for the neurons to rewire and and all that stuff. Um, so I don't know. I think practically speaking, there, like you said, it's both. There can be you know, many years of gradual incremental, um, you know, transformation, both subjectively and physiologically. And then, you know, at a certain point when you're ready, there can be a rather profound and dramatic shift, um, mm -hmm. which can be permanent. Uh, but, exactly. and so, you know, it's like, there's no conflict between the two notions, I think. And who knows what happened before. So like with Rumi, mm -hmm. um, you know, he met uh, his, spiritual master and was awakened in that moment. Mm -hmm. But he was obviously awakened writing poetry and very wise previous to that moment. So I believe there were many moments of gradual um, insight that allowed your brain, your physiology, your nervous system, your mind to be, to be capable of such a radical shift because actually it can be quite dangerous. I believe, um, if you're not prepared yep. um, for, for, for a radical shift. And this is why um, I'm not against drugs, but I, I'm always cautioning people, you know, <laughs> because many people say, but why would you sit and meditate, you know, for every day when you can just take some drug that will change your consciousness immediately and it's quicker. And I say, no, it's not, you know, <laughs> in the end, you still have to prepare for the shift. Yeah. So that, it's not quicker. It's just that you get very confused when you come back to this reality and you have to work. Well, you've already seen what you have to do. It's very confusing to have to do all those things. In the end, it's better to, to better in my perspective, to take things gra slowly and, and gradually mm -hmm. enhance your awareness so that you're capable of deeper awareness, not to push your awareness into a state which is so um, um, unable to process the information that sometimes there is a regression that happens. Yeah. You know? So meditation is so very important and this is what gradual awakening means. I believe every moment we sit in meditation, we're awakening our consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is why it's so profoundly um, important, like you were saying, um, to, to give you energy and to bring back vitality and, and health. Yeah, I mean, there's a few popular phrases that are appropriate here. Slow and steady wins the race. 
<laughs> safety first. Um, you know, and drugs can, <laughs> drugs can give you a glimpse, but they're not going, they're not capable of, and you may never forget that glimpse. You might realize, well, there is something really profound that I don't ordinarily experience, uh, and exactly. I could come back to that maybe, but they don't really have the capability of producing the neurophysiological transformation in a thorough and stable way that's going to enable you to live that um, as a natural state 24-7. Exactly. Uh, and some people using um, drugs may sort of be offended by what I'm saying now, but I, I believe that sometimes it's important to see things in a different way. You know, like when you travel and you see a country that's totally different from where you live and how people do things differently from the way that you do things, it opens your mind. Yeah. But beyond that, the opening has to happen in a natural, very... Um, a cumulative way and this is why meditation is my, the central core of what I teach to mm -hmm. people. Yeah. yeah, I mean and in my position talking to all these people and having all these people listen, I, I often get reports of people who have gotten into serious trouble. I mean I get good reports from people doing ayahuasca and stuff and I know you've done that and maybe we'll, we'll get on to that but I, I also get the the you know the train, the car wreck stories of people really getting into trouble, or you know through or having Kundalini awakenings for which they weren't prepared, not necessarily exactly. through, through drugs, but through other means, and then being incapacitated and all. So there's there's a real value, I think, in you know culturing the nervous system, for, you know doing something in a in a stable, steady, um, safe manner that's going to be effective in the long term. Exactly, because in the end, that's what matters. It's yeah, not, it's not just an. In, you know, Western people are too. It's a used marathon, to not a sprint, as they say. Exactly, <laughs> it's not instant satisfaction, because in the end, you know, it's about your life and what happens with your life. You know, the legacy that you leave behind. So, you know, it, just one moment of, I don't know, LSD or ayahuasca, can rewire the brain in such a way where there is more difficulty. You're actually having to do more work yeah. and then less work. You can do some I mean, damage that has to be undone. For sure, yeah. for sure. As you say, I, you know, it's not new to me. I, I, I was in the Amazon forest working with native people mm -hmm. and I was initiated in, in um, the ritual of ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. I would never recommend it mm. for people um, unless, you know, there are very specific things you, you have cancer or you you know the physical ailments that perhaps you know you don't have the time so you need to work through things um, physically that uh, transform your body but for for mental stability and for mental clarity and focus it's not the way for me yeah yeah <laughs> And well, like you said, there are specific things. I mean, Johns Hopkins is doing studies now with psilocybin and, and its efficacy in helping, you know, people with various addictions and things like that. So, for sure, you know, there, sure. there, we never, you know, you never say never. There, there is a value exactly. in these things. But you know, if you're a serious spiritual practitioner who is interested in enlightenment, then you know, there it's tempting to go for shortcuts and in our culture you know the fast food culture people are always interested in those but so important yes. to be really sober about this stuff and careful and enjoy it you know it's not why why try to get somewhere when it's so enjoyable to sit in meditation why yeah. when it's so fun to explore consciousness and learn about yourself and the world and reality from a different perspective you know people who seek instant satisfaction are usually depressed. Mm. So, you know, depression needs to be um, worked with prior to, you know, um, you know, trying to change your life. So you need to understand the psychology of your personality and, and being before you, you know, start using um, whatever to change that. Meditation um, can be very difficult, say, if you're depressed, because very often makes you more depressed. Yeah. People have told me this. Mm -hmm. You know, they sit in meditation, they say, it's not like you say, you know, it's not a joyous experience. I'm not feeling blissful. I'm not feeling happy. I, I just remember how depressed I am and I sit there feeling worse. Mm. Uh, but, you know, that's part of the transformation again, you know. Could be part of that washing machine dissolution <laughs> effect we were talking about in the beginning where you're actually, exactly. now, now the stuff is being resolved and you, you feel it more acutely while it's being resolved. 
Exactly, yeah. a healing crisis. Right. Um, a few minutes ago, you mentioned Rumi, and we were talking about you know, awakening and gradual or instantaneous in various degrees of awakening. It reminded me of a Sufi saying that I think is apropos, which is that um, there's an end to the path to God, but there's no end to the path in God. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had technical problems in the beginning. We lost some of the time that I hope to spend with you, and I know you have to go in about half an hour. Um, oh, yeah. So um, what uh, have we not covered yet that you want to be sure to cover in this interview? And we can do another one in the future, but for today, you know, what are some important things that you'd like to bring out that we haven't had a chance to? Um, I would say what you eat, your uh -huh. diet. Um, I, I believe this to be very important simply because the Western diet, I know this is sort of going back to the mundane, but I, um, the Western diet is so unhealthy and it's so not for meditation. Mm. Uh, to, it, it doesn't support meditation. So um, I'm not saying vegetarianism is the way, but just making sure that the food that you eat supports the change, the physiological and the neurological change in your mind mm -hmm. and in your brain. Um, and I would say it's important to eat um, less of certain foods, um, foods that stimulate um, the mind, sugar, um, and um, I would say less meat and more plant-based um, mm -hmm. foods. Um, of course, processed foods, you know, with all MSG and colorings and what have you. you know, this is all obvious to people who are already meditating and um, choosing a healthy lifestyle. But I, I do believe this to be a very important aspect of um, transformation. The physical body is part of the transformation. We're not just transforming the mind. We need to take into account the physical body. Yeah. You know, I live in a town where a lot of people meditate, um, Fairfield, Iowa. And a lot of people have be became vegetarians years ago. And, um, you know, I see them in the grocery store buying donuts and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, not everybody. I'm sure some are on a healthy routine. But I, I think there's a lot of people who sort of, you know, they could use a lot more exercise and they could use a healthier diet. And the healthier diet doesn't just mean vegetarianism. It means some of the things you just mentioned. And, you know, a lot of times they end up heavy on the starches and sugars and cr having these cravings for things because they're not getting the proteins and, uh, exactly. and, and then run into serious health problems down the line. I think people who are not healthy vegetarians can, can really um, damage their body, you know, so there is B12 deficiency, mm -hmm. which, you know, neurologically makes it more difficult to relax and meditate, you know, so if you don't have B12, you know, basically you suffer from depression and neurological damage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're eating donuts because, or vegan donuts or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> that, that's not the way. So what I'm saying is to reduce certain foods and to increase the foods that support um, the nervous system and the, the brain to function in a better way. And we know this, for example, the Mediterranean diet is oh, yeah. heavy on plant-based foods, mm -hmm. lots of vegetables, a variety of vegetables, mm -hmm. a variety of fruit, and it doesn't include all these trans fats and donuts and right. sugars. You know, it, it's based on fresh produce. And I think this is something that I, I noticed whilst in America, you know, generally, uh, people are into fast food and quick food. Mm. Um, you know, in Italy, there is this slow food movement where everything is cooked right from the beginning, you know, and I know people don't have time, but if you're, if you're serious about transformation, make time, you know, to exercise and make time to eat food that is transformative. So I always make sure, you know, that's something I um, convey in, in the retreats that um, people come to, that, you know, it's, it's a habit. Once you, once you create a healthy habit, it's easy to put into practice, you know, it's it's easy to reach out for whatever, I don't know, the pizza or the burger or what have you. Um, but it's, 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 you know, just as easy to, if you know how to, um, to prepare something that's slightly healthier. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to be fanatical, you know, like some people get obsessed by food. I'm not talking about being obsessed by, you know, everything that you eat and uh, because that's another diversion, but just to be aware 
you know, because sometimes I've noticed people who meditate, many people come to me and say, well, I'm not interested in the physical aspect. You know, I'm more interested in transforming the ego mind. And, and, and you know, there is there isn't that correlation. You know, the, the Buddha worked with their with his body, you know, and every mystic works with their body to transform the body to prepare for this awakening experience, mm -hmm. which which is a slow process, changing your habits. Body is the temple of the soul. Exactly, and exercising, like you, you say, you know, it's, it's so easy, um, just walking or swimming or, I don't know, whatever exercise, if you've got a dog, you know, just chasing, um, you know, kicking a ball or doing whatever, you know, it's fun. Yeah. Um, and too many people sit, you know, and this is the thing in the Western world, you know, people think, and also in the Zen Buddhist center, you know, sitting was an incredible, uh, difficult thing for me to do because I, I didn't actually, do, yeah, I had to sit for um, 16 hours Whoa. when when doing medita intensive meditation, yeah. you know, that's difficult, you know, but there was always a five minute break where you'd walk around, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in yeah, there's a saying these days uh, in medical circles, sitting is the new smoking. Um, in exactly. other words, they understand now that physical inactivity is extremely deleterious. And uh, you, you really, and you know, the reason we're dwelling on this, I mean, people might be wondering, what is this turning into some kind of health lecture? But, <laughs> um, but you know, the, the principle here, I think, which hopefully is clear, is that the, the body is, the, it's a vehicle. And, it, it, and, you know, it's a vehicle through which, if we want enlightenment and so on, we, we, we attain it in a body. And if that body is damaged in some way or malfunctioning, it's going to be an impediment to our, to our exactly. enlightenment. Yeah. As you say, you know, what is meditation? It's about finding a state of happiness that is sustainable. And if the body is not happy, then how can the mind be happy? Yeah. You know? and if the mind is not happy, how can the body be happy? They're correlated. Yes. They're integrated. They're, yeah, they're related. interrelated. Yeah. Exactly. Very closely. I mean, and you know, if you were to sit somebody like the Buddha or Ramana Maharshi or Jesus or somebody down and hook them up to EEG and various other physiological measurements, you'd find, I think, that those physiological measurements were quite distinctly different than the norm, than the average. That, exactly. So that person was not only in a very different state subjectively, their whole physiology had been transformed in its functioning. Exactly. And that is my um, you know, work to to change the physical body mm -hmm. so that there isn't a shock from, as you were saying previously, a Kundalini energy movement, you know, so that body is um, sensitive to energy, but able to sustain that energy, which is something that um, as a child, I wasn't able to do. Mm -hmm. So this is why I was sick. So I haven't been sick, touch wood, um, since, you know, being a teenager, you know, like for many, many, many years, yeah. because, you know, your body heals when your mind heals and your mind heals when your body heals. Mm -hmm. So I think this is important. The other thing that perhaps, um, you know, um, is useful is moments of stillness and integration. Um, we, we, we are fed too much information, um, you know, um, th there is there is just too much information out there, books, um, YouTube, videos, what have you, yeah. and, and there is an overload, and we don't give ourselves enough time to just be still, you know, mm -hmm. to, to do nothing, you know, to sit with your dog and pat it and, you know, just enjoy doing nothing, or to sit in the garden and just relax, and those moments allow for creativity, and if you remember what I was speaking about, creativity is a fundamental part of the meditational technique that I work with, mm -hmm. and creativity is missing in people's world because we're too busy. And so this is something else I speak about journaling or creating a vision board where you you just allow for creativity to manifest within stillness or within just doing nothing, a doing nothing space. Mm. Um, so you were talking a minute ago about preparing the body to be able to sustain the intensity of the spiritual energy. And in your, your book that I was reading, you said the energy of the world is becoming more intense. And w one thing that, um, well, I'll just read one more little thing from your book. You say, I see the world yes. getting more positive and that we are entering an era where light is more abundant, more present than it ever has been throughout recent history. And one thing that I keep encountering is people who actually weren't even that interested in spirituality, maybe not at all. 
they like to watch football and have a beer. And, and all of a mm -hmm. sudden they had some kind of spiritual awakening and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, and it's, you know, it's sort of like totally rocked their world. So, I mean, in your teaching, in your activity as a spiritual teacher, have you run into such people who have had a, a spiritual awakening for which they appear not to have been prepared? And have you been able to help them kind of, you know, adjust to it and, and normalize? Yes, many, many people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, you know, as you, as you said, you know, the world is more positive, um, meaning that the situations around us are more difficult. But because we are challenged to make a choice, many of us make the choice to come back to um, an awareness that is very positive, meaning that we want to change. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just be in limbo. We don't want to just sit on the fence. We want to change. And many people are doing that without realizing why they're doing that. It's just an internal um, dialogue that is happening perhaps on the subconscious level yeah. that allows them to all of a sudden wake up one day and, oh, something is different. I have to do things in a different way, um, but I don't know how to do this. And then they begin searching. And very, very often, many, many people find something like meditation or um, some some sort of um, technique or healing modality that changes um, their whole perspective. And yes, so this is something that I very much um, like to work with in, in the retreats, how to create um, a space to, to go beyond just the negativity of looking at the world as a difficult place. Because so many people do that, you know, so many people actually watch whatever, the news or football or um, entertainment on TV, because on some level, the mind has been overwhelmed by the negativity of all the information that's out there, or, and also the internal ones, you know, the negative belief systems. So we just, we sort of give up, many people give up and um, want to entertain their mind with all sorts of information. And this is why there is, there are people that are watching um, the news or connected to Facebook or social media and addicted to it all the time because mm. they're too afraid to face that aspect of themselves that allows for this change. Um, but I believe the positivity that is in the world today allows many to make a choice to step out of that limbo situation where they're just being entertained and make a choice. Okay, I want to do things differently. How can I do this in a different way? And then as you know, you know, if you begin to look for something, it just simply appears. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's true. Seek and you shall find. It really works. Yeah, it yeah. does. Wherever your focus is, that's where energy goes and that's where manifestation happens. Yeah. So um, I believe that we can manifest many, many interesting things. You know, even if it's not directly learning techniques of meditation, it could be just situations, people we meet that make a big difference in our lives and that help us to take another step um, into a world that we perhaps would have never got into if we didn't meet those people. Yeah, but when you say the energy of the world is becoming more intense, are you meaning like that the, uh, my sense of that is that the, the collective consciousness uh, uh, is rising in some fundamental way and, exactly. and um, it's like, it's like if you take the analogy of a forest, let's say somehow the ground in the forest became more fertile it was becoming a lot more fertile for some reason. And all the exactly. plants would, would find themselves growing more quickly, both the exactly. weeds, maybe, and the good exactly. plants. And so there's this sort of um, acceleration or, uh, of all kinds of tendencies, almost paradoxically opposed ones, negative, positive. There's this sort exactly. of the drama is getting more dramatic. Um, exactly. Yeah. And so, That's I mean, exactly right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I mean. You know, the the contrast between everything is it's it becomes so obvious um, for people that are aware. You know, if you're looking at the situation, that actually we know that that's there because we need to make a choice, not because things are getting worse, but we need to make a choice to either you know give up or to to move with the transformation. You know, yeah. to allow that transformation to happen. So the forest is growing. But, you know, we have to grow with the forest because we're part of the forest. We can't just sit and pretend that, you know, everything is accelerating and nothing is happening to us as individuals. So if we, if we go with that flow, then that's the intensity, I mean, um, that things can dramatically transform now 
more easily. We can change things more easily now than perhaps a thousand years ago. Um, for some reason, um, I believe that we, we, we are gifted. Everyone that's in this incarnation manifest in this world today, we're gifted. It's not a bad, it's not a difficult time. It's, it's actually a beautiful time to, to, to learn um, about consciousness. Um, and we've for, perhaps we've gone through these periods um, during the history of evolution. Um, but I believe this time is even more powerful. I think it is. So I think what you're saying is it's a time of great opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. I think somebody was telling me recently, uh, it was somebody who speaks Chinese, I think, and they were saying that the symbol for crisis in, in the Chinese language also contains the symbol for opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if you're not challenged, how do you grow? Mm. And because we're all challenged as you know, as humanity is being challenged now by situations that we're facing, whatever they are, you know, the uh, climate change, if you believe in climate change, some people don't. Um, it's not uh, a question of belief in that yeah, opinion. Yeah. <laughs> some people deny it. Do you believe in um, gravity? Um, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> some people don't. <laughs> but, you know, all these things are not negatives as some, you know, worry. Um, some people worry about it. Some scientists, you know, because I, I studied science and you know, at university. That's right, yeah. That was my, um, that's what I studied. Um, and scientists say, you know, we've reached a point where perhaps we will never be able to go back. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's reached a point where the crisis is so bad, it's not reversible. But I don't I don't see that. I I really see things changing dramatically in ways that we don't recognize even in science today because it's much more complex. Reality is much more complex than the linear perspective that science, the old science, not the new science, yeah. um, ha has based itself on. Well, that's not to say that these changes are not going to be traumatic. <laughs> I mean, there's a glacier in Antarctica which shows signs of melting and breaking up. And if it does, sea levels could rise 10 to 13 feet in a relatively short amount of time, which is going to displace 145 million people. It's going to make the Syria problem look like a Boy Scout picnic or something. Um, so, you know, the world could be headed for some pretty intense things as these changes take place. But I think um, concurrently there is a spiritual awakening taking place. It's just funny to, it's interesting to sort of ponder the juxtaposition of this sort of you know, inner and outer change. Exactly. Do you know, I was watching something on a video one long time ago and it was in Syria and it was about a piano player mm. playing piano in the middle of the war zone. Wow. And it was it was so incredible. You know, it was like the contrast of bombs and houses destroyed and people in a sort of war confused state. And then this person playing classical music on a piano, huh. you know. So I, yeah, we are heading towards, you know, an, a, a situation where there will be extremes and I do hope that the that Antarctica and all the, the ice doesn't melt like people are saying mm -hmm. will will happen um, because it's not just about the sea rising it's also about currents changing yeah. in science this is what they're afraid of you know and the currents changing means that the whole world ecosystem is just will collapse you know but well if the gulf stream stops then great britain is going to have a climate like northern canada yeah, exactly. <laughs> and who knows what else. Um, but, you know, even in those moments, it is still possible to connect to consciousness. And yeah. this is what I was saying in the beginning, you know, with starvation and war and pain, we, we still have access to consciousness that allows us an intuition and a creativity to, to be like that piano player, to, to create music, you know, which is the language of peace and the language that comes from the depth of one's heart and to create music to hopefully inspire people. And of course, it inspired what inspired me to see someone in such a situation, you know, giving giving this to the world rather than um, the confusion that is obvious when you're in a war zone. Yeah. And I would not only say even in those moments, I would say especially in those moments, I, I think that the if, if we lived in a heavenly world, you know, people might not have the motivation to look within and and uh, strive for enlightenment. But when the going gets rough, people begin to feel like this is so unsatisfactory. There must be something deeper. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. 
Well, um, we should wrap it up pretty soon. Is there, is there anything else that's dear to your heart that you haven't had a chance to express? <laughs> Last time I asked you that question, you mentioned diet. Um, do you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you, we should break and have a salad. Um, do you have Do you have any like? Um, do you want to give a, people a kind of an overview of your teaching activities, yeah. how you offer, what you offer? Yeah. Actually, I work online a lot. See, so yeah. In fact, that's why we have to wrap it up because you have some online webinar coming up exactly. in a few minutes. Exactly. Um, and I think this is an easy way for people to um, connect today. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many, many, many online programs that, and the idea behind the programs is not just more information, but transmission. Mm -hmm. So it's an energetic experience. And um, you feel that can be done online? Even though people are all over the world, there is definitely an energetic transmission? For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like meditating. You know, the more people who meditate, doesn't matter if they're sitting in China or sitting in Chile, you know, there is a connection on this other level, this multidimensional level that is very obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why it's so important that many people connect on this level. Um, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not just the numbers, it's the fact that we well, this is for another interview, but we can yeah. move from one dimension to another um, within our perceptions and, and really connect to what transmission means, just as we connect to the warmth of the sun or the beauty of um, the ocean. You know, there, there there is so much intuitive connection that happens also online. But of course, for those who want to work um, in a personal setting, um, I do this in retreat um, and retreats are usually in Portugal. Oh, so, okay. You and Muji. But, uh, yeah, for some reason that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I was yeah. there before Muji actually, okay. um, but Muji moved and there are some other people moving into Portugal. Hmm. Um, so it's interesting and I, I do believe it's an amazing and um, it's a beautiful place. It's hmm. not just uh, beautiful, but the energy is beautiful. Nice. So that, that's where the retreats are held. Okay. Um, I do some talks in the UK um, and yeah, all the information is on tonysamara.com, okay. you know, website. And I'll be linking to that, obviously, and yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do another one one of these days. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, I'm sure there's plenty of points we could have discussed uh, and yeah. will discuss next time around. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks. Um, let me make a few little wrap-up points. So I've been speaking okay. with Tony Samara, and... Um, You've learned a lot about him in the last hour and a half, and it can go to his website to learn more. Um, uh, this is an ongoing series of interviews, as most of you know, and if you'd like to be um, notified of uh, future ones as they are posted, you could sign up to for my email newsletter list on batgap.com and also explore the menus there and you'll see what else is offered, one of which is an audio podcast of the show, and if you'd like to listen while you commute. Um, and one other thing is that uh, I've been speaking with a representative at YouTube and, and there's this thing where if you have a hundred thousand subscribers to your show you get all sorts of special support and everything from YouTube and I'm, I'm currently at 28,000 after seven years but uh, I'd like to encourage people watching to subscribe to just hit the subscribe button on in the YouTube channel it basically just means you'll get an email uh, once in a while from YouTube notifying you of new shows on any channel to which you've subscribed but it'll help that gap a lot if you if you do that it'll help me get more support from youtube and collaboration with them so thanks for that and thanks for listening or watching and and thank you tony i really appreciate thank you. your time i really enjoyed preparing for this and also doing it you're you're an interesting guy to talk to thank you very much yeah <laughs> so thanks everybody and we'll see you next time